SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our topic today is who, what, where, why do the alert ICE teams investigate predators in our community? And I please welcome our speaker, Constable Heather Bengo. Good, more, or good afternoon now, I guess, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, you will figure out real quickly, I'm very passionate about this, I could talk all day about this, so uh, I, uh, the challenge for me today is to keep it under 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, as you said, my name is Constable Heather Bangle, and I'm with the Southern Alberta Internet Child Exploitation Unit. Uh, here to chat with you today about who we are, and what we do, and why we do it. Um, and I'll get into specifics in just a second. So, the Internet Child Exploitation Unit uh, has been a work in progress over the last couple decades. In 2004 is when the National Center for uh, Child Exploitation, so it's the National Child Exploitation Crime Center. We have acronyms for everything, we gotta keep them all straight. Down in the States, there's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And in May of 2006, the province of Alberta created the first ICE unit. I can say that it, uh, I've been in the ICE unit now for 14 years, which I know sounds crazy, but it is by far uh, one of the most rewarding uh, jobs I've had so far in my career as RC, an RCMP member. And uh, we have an excellent team with, uh, full of lots of really smart investigators and forensic techs and people that uh, work to put bad guys in jail. Um, as you can see, the partners uh, within our unit, because um, Alert covers is the Alberta Law Enforcement Response Teams, and we have a unit in the north and a unit in the south. The one in the north is just Edmonton Police Service and RCMP. The one in the south, we have uh, RCMP, Calgary Police Service, we have uh, Medicine Hat Police Service, Lethbridge Police Service, and then just recently we got another member from the Lacombe Police Service donated to us, and he works out of our Red office. And we're hoping to get a Tabor member as well soon. Um, <clears throat> when I started, there was nine people in the ICE unit here in the south, and we are now up to 31. And we can still double that and be busy. Wow. Uh, in my office, my staff sergeant, he's a Calgary Police Duty uh, Service Police Service member, uh, and our ops NCO is a sergeant with the RCMP. And then we have 15 investigators, give or take, on any day. Um, we've got eight CPS, four RCMP. We've got Constable Anthony Tupper here with the Lethbridge Police Service, and one Medicine Hat and one local guy, as I said. But we also have uh, in-house digital forensics. We were the first ICE unit across the country to uh, have this model. And uh, it, I'm very proud of it. I'd like to say that we have trailblazed a path to show how um, we can do things more efficiently. And so we have two RCMP, uh, well, I should actually say five, sorry. Five RCMP, they're employed by the RCMP, but two of them are police officers. The other three are just public servants. And then we've got six corporate alert uh, forensic techs. But they come with us to every search warrant. And uh, we've actually got a mobile forensic unit now, also the first one in the country, um, that comes with us to every warrant to help us preview devices. So A, we can figure out who did it faster and not overseas, because overseas can be an issue. Uh, on the back side of the unit, we've got the uh, admin support, who of course helps run the office. We've got an analyst position, currently vacant. Don't get me going on why. Uh, a researcher, a disclosure clerk, and then we also have specialized Crown prosecutors. So we work with the same Crown for all our files, and there's about five, six on their team at any given time, which I've been in the unit long enough to talk to units across the country and, and around the world, and to have this is huge because 
it's so technical, it's so specific. There are just things that people don't understand. And so not having to re-educate a Crown Prosecutor every time um, is huge. These girls, they know it, they get it. Um, we don't need to ex explain BitTorrent or IP addresses or cookies or different things. They know it, so, uh, and they are pit bulls and they are awesome. So our mandate, um, so that kind of covers off who we are, right? What we do is we investigate the sexual exploitation of children through the internet. And then we are also now working to reduce harm through public education and prevention programs. If you would have asked me 10 years ago to, for ICE to do this, I would say, no, 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 no. We need, we need the detachments, the districts, the schools, they need to educate the kids, you know. And now it's just not happening. And so recently we've implemented, uh, Alert has created this community engagement team. Right now it's basically me. <laughs> and uh, our inspector who works out of Edmonton, and then they're bringing on an EPS person, and we're just gonna go out there and just flood the communities with information. So uh, this is awesome, this is a public uh, community group. I'll be going to schools, I'll be going to school divisions, I'll be going to detachments. I've got the experience and the know-how to go into even you know these junior members who get a luring file, they don't have, they don't know what to do. They don't even know where to start. So <clears throat> I'm gonna try and get out there to help uh, educate that. The offenses we cover off, child pornography, luring, making sexually explicit material available to a child, making an agreement or an arrangement to offend against a child, <clears throat> and voyeurism when they are under the age of 18. And of course we liaise with any and all law, law enforcement services because this clearly is, uh, a borderless crime. So we might have an offender here in Lethbridge and a victim here in Lethbridge, but we also might have an offender here in Lethbridge and the victims in the UK. Or we might have the victim here and the offender is in Australia. So uh, we work with law enforcement all over the place and around the world. The majority of the files that we get right now are from NECMEC, as I mentioned. So that's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children down in the United States. As with Canada, but it's not as significant because we don't have as many ISPs like Facebook, Google, like anything Microsoft, uh, they have a duty to report down there. So anytime they have come across any type of child exploitation on their platforms, they are required by law to report it to the National Center down there. So they'll take a look at the IP address. Oh, that's Canada. They'll send it to our National Center. Oh, that's Southern Alberta and they'll send it to us, and then that's when we get assigned the file and, and start investigating. Uh, CyberTip is the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. They are a great resource. I got some resources on the side. They're on your tables there. There's more on the side there if anybody wants any. Um, we have lots more, that's just all I brought today. And um, they're a great resource online too if parents or kids or anyone is struggling or needs any help or information. We, try, we are trying to do more and more proactive investigations. It's hard when we're so busy, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, but uh, we do peer-to-peer, -peer, which is file sharing investigations, and UCOs. Um, we also get lots of requests from local police agencies, detachments, um, from you know the boots on the ground, all on the front, front line, uh, calling us and asking us for help, direction, advice, um, and just referring us files where we're like, we'll just take that over for you. Uh, and as I mentioned, lots of international investigations. I uh, myself personally helped uh, create uh, history over in Australia during the pandemic when we were supposed to go over. I was supposed to take two victims over there with their guardians and to Melbourne, where the offender was, and uh, the pandemic hit, so we ended up doing it via secure telecommunication, and the girls um, testified over camera, and it was the first time this was ever done, so I'm kind of sad, because now I will never get to go to Melbourne. <laughs> but uh, but it, it was great, the way that we all worked together, including the courts over there, and with the time difference and everything like that, it was, uh, it was quite the juggling act, but it got done. And then ICE units across the country. Child pornography, so that is like, the primary offense that we investigate, right? It all comes down to that. Um, I have at the bottom CSAM, so child sexual abuse material. 
that is the terminology we are trying to shift to. Um, so, but when I write a warrant, I still have to call it child pornography because that's the defi definition in the criminal code of Canada. Um, but you know, a lot of times people think of child pornography, they think it's like the child in the bathtub or you know, the kids dressing up all sexy. But uh, really, truly, at the end of the day, it is an image, it is a photograph, it is a documentation of child sexual abuse. <coughs> it is a crime scene. And every time that those images and videos get shared, that child is being re-victimized again and again. <clears throat> uh, I won't read all of this, but you guys kind of get the idea that it's like a photograph or a film. Uh, a video, right? But it just has to show someone who is under the age of 18 or depicted as being under the age of 18, and they're like, they're, the primary focus is on a sexual organ or they're engaged in a sexual activity. So they could be fully dressed, but if they're committing or, you know, performing oral sex on someone, that's child pornography. <clears throat> and then we also have got, uh, we've actually got good laws in Canada in the sense that we also, we, we investigate and charge and convict for written material. So people who write stories about abusing children and uh, illustrations like cartoons, henna and stuff like that, that is considered child pornography. If you don't get that down in the United States. Although down in the United States, you do get better penalties. <laughs> so, um, Make available, transmit is the second one there, sub three. Uh, possess, access, and then make. Uh, a lot of times um, we could easily just have a possess and access file, but when we go to do the forensics, that's when we find that they're actually hands-on defenders and, uh, and we get more offenses out of that. Just to give you a little idea of the problem, because um, like I said, we. Child pornography, luring, voyeurism, all these other offenses. In terms of child pornography, just the sharing of it. Uh, back in the old days, I'm sure you guys have heard of like Napster, and you know, remember 20, 30 years ago, you uh, you could download a file on a file sharing program, and so it's a lot more efficient today. But we do these peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, investigations, and so. I'm gonna play this video. Each one of these pins uh, identifies an IP address when this video was taken. It was taken a little while ago, but it still is the same, if not worse. And it will identify every spot where an IP address has been observed sharing and making available child pornography. I think it was over a one week period. We got these uh, tools that we're able to investigate these um, that were developed out in the United States by a ex-law enforcement officer and he created a company that uh, and invested a lot of money in to help create these tools for law enforcement. So I know they start with, they zoom in to Lethbridge here. And so, and then each pin there actually has other pins. So it's a little more prolific <coughs> than people realize. Then we go over to Medicine Hat. So even just looking at all those dots as they move over to Calgary, I'll just say, we typically, my unit does a warrant every Tuesday and every Thursday. Uh, if it's out of town, like we will be in the near future down south here, it's gonna be Wednesday and Thursday. But even doing two a week does not knock off all these. 
So now we're moving into Calgary. So each one of those is an IP address that had been seen over a seven day period. Those are all different IP addresses of someone that was actively sharing and making available child pornography for people to download. <clears throat> so internet luring is another big one that we deal with. Um, it's a very confusing uh, offense because there's uh, a lot of components to it, but the easiest way to describe it is that luring is, is just someone who uses telecommunication to facilitate an offense. That secondary offense does not actually have to have occurred. So if a 40-year-old male asks a 16-year-old girl to send him a naked picture, and he tells her, or she, sorry, she tells him to pound Sam, he's still committed the offense just by asking, right? Or luring if, if, it, if they're under the age of 16 then, and they ask them to meet up, to hook up, that is the offense. They don't actually have to have met in order for that to have occurred. Fortunately, a lot of the ones that we investigate, it did occur, um, or the images were shared, so but that's also keeps us very busy and those are the majority of the ones that we get from outside detachments and districts when the parents find the devices. Of course, don't get me going on case law, which requires us to get a warrant for said victim's device, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Gotta respect the courts. Uh, our offenses do have minimum mandatories, however, uh, some of these do not apply anymore because uh, these minimum mandatories have been challenged in court and so uh, they're not applied as much. So we've gone from having minimum, like mandatory jail time to uh, other, you know, peace, well, peace bonds, conditional sentences, a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> making sexually explicit material available to a child. That, I, I loved it when that offense came in because that makes it an offense to send to someone. So, so, so often in these luring files, the offender will send an, a, like a, a sexualized image, whether it be their erect penis or something else. Just that alone is the offense. So when we do track down this person, we're able to charge them with luring and making sexually explicit material. Uh, this is when you make an arrangement or an agreement. It's not as common that we charge with this one, but don't, we're not naive that it's happening quite a bit. Uh, those people are just a lot smarter, a lot stealthier um, with all the things if technology provides nowadays. And then voyeurism, of course, is, uh, you know, when there's anything being done where there's an expectation of privacy, when there's someone under the age of 18. One thing I should stress though is for our unit specifically, we try and focus on like these, these offenses happen, but they don't always hit the internet. So our unit, our goal is like, our mandate is for those offenses that hit the internet. So here's an example of how busy we are. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, I've been in the unit for quite a while, but back in uh, January, and well, from January to December back in 2014, I do remember the days of we had about three, 400 files a year, and then it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And so now, last year, I think we ended with just over 1,600 files. And that's just in the South, and that's just with the, like I said, about eight to 12 investigators on any given day. So, uh, unfortunate, it is unfortunate, a lot of these files don't get action because there's just not the resources or the time to do it. So we have to try and be very selective in the ones that we do action. Uh, oh, I'm doing okay for time here. Uh, some of the issues today for kids online, um, I suspect most of yours, if you have any, are probably all grown up, but uh, probably have some grandchildren hanging around, uh, coming over, and uh, there's a lot of cyberbullying, which we don't deal with so much. That's uh, the detachment school resources, but they get exposed to inappropriate material all the time. Like, how easy is it for them to just go Google something and something comes up or go to Pornhub or 
Like there's just so many websites out there that uh, they may intentionally look for or they just might accidentally come across. A great example is my daughter was, she loves to sing. And so she actually was on at the computer at my, my parents' house because she likes to go down to her grandparents. And it's in an open space, but she wanted to look at love songs. And just some of the results that came up as a result of that, <clears throat> she, it bothered her, right? And she was exposed to things that I haven't really talked to her about yet. Nothing that we would consider offensive, like, you know, we're pleased we get involved, but <clears throat> just the, the material itself, right? Kids are just getting exposed so much younger. Sexting is a big thing. There is not a teenager out there that does not know when you mean what you mean if you were to say, do you send? Do you send? Do you send? Or what a nude is? You know? Because kids do it. I tell parents, you think your kid won't? They will. So, uh, that's the fight, one of the fights we're fighting, is just getting out there and educating kids. They might be boyfriend, girlfriend today. It's not necessarily illegal because they're, you know, same age. They're not, you know, the intent isn't there for, uh, to be uh, criminal, but there, and there is case law out there that allows uh, close in age, um, issues to be uh, worked out without involving law enforcement or charges, but uh, what the problem is is when they break up or if their friend sees it and then they get telling and then they, you know, their whole world just comes crashing down. Sextortion is huge right now, huge, huge, huge. Um, can't stress that enough. Uh, the one thing I tell every parent, guardian, grandparent, friend, teacher, uh, talk to your kids about this. Just talk to them and just let them know that it's out there, it's happening, and uh, if it happens to you, to tell someone. Because uh, they get lured, it's super fast. Um, it's, you know, like Snapchat, all the kids are on Snapchat, and you got quick ad, and so they're talking to people, they have no idea who's on the other end, and then they convince them to send them a picture of their face, and then they convince them, oh, what's your Instagram? And then, oh, like, let's exchange pictures. And they send a picture of their penis. Or typically, it's the boys that are extorted for the financial uh, sextortion side. And as soon as they send that intimate image, though, they get a collage of, OK, I got your friends from your Instagram. I got your picture. I got your face. I got your Snapchat account. Now send me $200 in Apple gift cards. Or I'm going to send it out to your friends and family. Um, <clears throat> It happens a lot, and unfortunately, a lot of those uh, offenders are not from here. There are some, but majority there's a lot. It's like the new scam that, you know, back in the days where you got that email saying, oh, I have a million dollars I need to put in a bank somewhere. It's like from Nigeria or the Ivory Coast. There's a lot of offenders over there. We recently worked, uh, there was two members on my team, worked with uh, Law Enforcement US, FBI, DHS, and and they focused on these offenses and then they really honed in on the ones that resulted in suicide so <clears throat> but it's uh it's not an easy thing and it happens constantly uh, i live in a small town outside of strathmore and i already know three or four kids that this has happened to that i know about so i guarantee there's more <clears throat> and then the luring of course like um the uh just the you know, it's just so easy to approach kids online and kids are just so trusting. You know, they think they're talking to that 16 year old girl when really it's a 35 year old guy in Nebraska or the UK or wherever. Common apps our kids use today. Uh, I don't suspect many of you are on these. Uh, I know I'm not on them, so. Uh, but I, you guarantee you'll hear the kids talking about them. Discord, Roblox, Instagram. Those are all things where there is that ability to direct message, to send messages, to start communicating with kids. So kids that are putting up YouTube videos or you know, playing games online in Discord, you know, it's nothing for a guarantee. If there is a platform where the kids are, there are predators there and they're exposed. Just kind of reiterating that, like the instant messaging, 
Okay, you can have lots of conversations. Encryption is becoming a huge thing. So, you know, like those reports that get sent to NECMEC, well, once they start uh, implementing encryption, like Facebook, their messages, so if I send a message to Tucker here, it's encrypted. Facebook doesn't see what I'm actually sending anymore, and so they can't report it, so our reports go down. <clears throat> Randomized chat, a lot of kids do this. Um, Zomigo that just got shut down, they just shut down because I think they were just overwhelmed with uh, the litigation and just dealing with the issues of uh, safety issues of, don't quote me on that, but I, I'm pretty sure that's the reason why. Uh, because you're just randomly connected to strangers anywhere in the world. And a lot of times these platforms, it might be someone that's exposing themselves as soon as you connect or um, get chatting and it's just, we've had files come in with those as well. Oh, I've already talked about sextortion. Uh, like I said, for, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read it again because it's just so important. So it's a form of child sexual exploitation where children are threatened or blackmailed, most often with the possibility of sharing with the public nude or sexual images of them by a person who demands additional sexual content, sexual activity, or money from the child. This crime may happen when a child has shared an image with someone. And it does happen a lot. I do, I will say the, the financial sextortion happens primarily to boys. I'm not saying it never happens to girls, but just primarily boys. And then the sexual sextortion, like the more images and that is usually with girls. Sometimes they just move on to the next victim if you tell them to go pound sand. But um, I do have some files, especially with the girls, where they do follow through with those threats. So most important thing, tell someone. There are things that we can do to help. <coughs> uh, so yeah, just some of the trends that we're seeing, um, the reporting of the possessing and manufacturing. Um, a lot of times, those people who are sharing the material are also the ones that are creating the material now. Uh, Criminal networks, there used to be that pay like, to watch, like especially like uh, over in the um, third world poor countries, um, they would <clears throat> stream sexual abuse. It still happens, but um, the sophistication that these child sex offenders are using is becoming more and more of a challenge every day. Uh, we'd be kidding ourselves if we thought we were ahead of them, we're not. And uh, just that self-production, my kids, some kids, they just don't even bat an eye about it. They just, it's nothing to send a nude to some stranger. So in the end, in closing, I just want to say, uh, it does take a village to raise a child as law enforcement. Uh, by the time it gets, our office gets involved, it's already happened. Um, and we can only do so much. We uh, work, my team is an amazing group of dedicated individuals who fight every day to help and support and save kids. But we need more support from families, educators, and our communities to help get the message out there. And uh, really, truly, the parents and caregivers are the first line of defense. Mark Edel, I'm just wondering, a good solution would be if we could get at the root of the problem. So is there a psychological profile, or is there anything that's common about these people who are accessing this that drives them to, to access child pornography, or to make it to? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, 14 years, I can tell you in my experience with online training, uh, predominantly, the only consistent thing about our offenders is they're male. No offense. Um, but we've arrested young people, old people, seniors, college students, married men, families of five kids, one kid, single guys that are completely immaculate in their home, whereas other guys live in a basement and it's just an absolute mess. Some that live with their parents. Uh, uh, all different, like we've levels of professions, right from unemployed to lawyers to police officers. Uh, we've uh, arrested Caucasian, uh, black, uh, Asian, East Indian. There's absolutely 
no way of knowing. It's 100% can be anyone. I always say, uh, if someone that I cared about got uh, caught up in this or was we discovered that they were sexually attracted to children or looking at child pornography, I would be absolutely devastated but not shocked. <laughs> Thanks kindly. Uh, my name is Ian Hurdle. I actually have two questions. Can you comment? Can you comment? Comment on the Supreme Court ruling uh, for a warrant for addresses, and for the people you don't have time to go and arrest, can you send them messages that might sort of shock them <laughs> into stopping? Oh. Some more good questions. Um, I don't know, I can't say too much about the Supreme Court ruling that just came out there last Friday on March 1st. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you my thoughts on it, or that it's not really gonna affect us too much. But I could be completely wrong. Um, we still are waiting for our Crown to review the decision and our alert unit to review the decision. Um, but at, the way I look at it is it, it might make it more sticky in some areas, but really truly, my unit, the investigations that we do, we don't typically go ask for IP addresses, which was the case here. Um, and when we do go ask for IP addresses, it's usually to a Snapchat or Facebook or someone, but we, and we already write production orders for those. So um, we'll see how the courts interpret it. It might be completely different, but um, I'm hoping that it's not gonna affect us too much. It's just gonna be a little bit of a learning curve to figure that out. Um, this is just to get the IP address too. This isn't in regards to the subscriber information, which kind of will go towards your second question in that, you know, could we just kind of send them a little something? Well, in order to, like when we get these reports, all we have that are given to us, like from the neck neck and that, are the IP addresses. Um, a lot of the times, that's all we got is an IP address. Or if we're involved, you know, investigating a learning file, we will write a production order to Snapchat for the basic subscriber information. Again, doesn't give us a name, address, phone number, nothing like that. And then we have to write another production order because of other case law, and that's the Spencer decision that came out in 2014 that um, says that the subscriber information is highly private, so we need a judicial authorization for that. So we have to write another production order to get the name and address of the person who used that IP address at that exact date and time. Um, and I say exact date and time because IPs are um, not static typically, and especially with the IPv6s that are coming out now, they change all the time. So what might be your IP address today is not gonna be your IP address tomorrow. So we have to write a production order just to get the subscriber information for that. So try and keep up, but uh, can't always do that. And But when we are able to write those production orders and get that subscriber information, if that file doesn't happen to get actioned, it is, I think, you know, a, a win when we are able to get the subscriber information, because if that file's not actioned, but we get two or three more files from that IP address, then it, it bumps up in the priority, right? So we do look at different things when we look at priority, so including like if it's first gen, like any images that we haven't seen before, um, or, uh, you know, if there's a kid in immediate, immediate, danger um, that would bump up as well, but then also those repeat offenders will bump it up. There's a lot of things that go into it. I'm Beth from Little Atherstone. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that you're going into the schools. Yeah. We know that education is the uh, number one um, way to teach children to protect them and keep them safe. I have two questions. <clears throat> One is in relation to the individuals, the, the uh, perpetrators. Um, it seems like it fits somewhere within the spectrum of um, uh, like gambling and alcohol and so on, that you become addicted to this particular thing. So I just wonder what you know about the addiction of predators. And the other uh, question is, has to do with organized crime, because you, 
you, you talked about um, luring and um, exploitation, and I'm just wondering how many of these kids um, are actually at risk of ending up in sex slavery, and uh, is organized crime involved? Thank you. Okay, tough questions. Um, <clears throat> so the first question was about um, addiction. addiction, right? So, uh, not being a psychologist, but have gone to numerous conferences that are dedicated to uh, the uh, crimes against children. Uh, again, it's kind of like the who does it? Well, I can't really say. It's um, when it comes to their motivation for offending, it can vary. And some of it is addiction. Some of it does. Some, like there are offenders out there that they just started out with a uh, porn addiction. And then that porn just wasn't enough for them. And so they kind of dabbled in some more taboo stuff. You know, you dip that toe in, and, oh, and then you dip it in again, and you keep going a little deeper until you get to that point where the only thing that they find uh, gratifying is um, sexual children, child sexual abuse material. And so it, it is an addiction for some. For others, um, it, that's not what it is. And <laughs> there's just so many different reasons why but um, they might just be true predators, right? Or they might be true pedophiles. Um, a lot of our, like a lot of the people that commit these crimes, they're not necessarily, they wouldn't, if they went and sat in front of a psychologist, they wouldn't have been uh, diagnosed with pedophilia because, uh, uh, you know, like the true, the, my understanding is the true definition of a pedophile is someone who is sexually attracted to children. And more specifically, it's uh, pubescent children. Like there's uh, other terms for different stages of which the child is in. So um, we have those that are just opportunists. They just want to get off. There's others that are just sadists. They just want to inflict pain. Um, and then there's some that are just ad addicted to it and they know it's wrong and they're struggling. Uh, and then there's others that are just like really truly sexually attracted to children. Um, <clears throat> second question was, what's that? Organized crime. Organized crime. <clears throat> so that's a tricky question. I don't have any stats on that, but I'm, I'm sure they are. But we actually, Alert has actually created a human trafficking unit now. And so, and part of those luring offenses that you, that you saw up there, like there's three different subtypes. But um, sub B, it does speak to procur procuring, you know, for sex and, and, and basically prostitution and, and the sex trade and all that kind of stuff. Um, how many of these kids does it happen to? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that one. But um, yes, it happens. But typically, I don't have a lot of experience on that side of things just because we've got that other unit. The ones that we deal with are, um, with the victims that we have in our communities, um, they, the ones that we deal with are just uh, not part of the organized crime thing. It's not really a great answer, is it? But um, I would say, you know, a lot of them do, but a lot of them don't. It's, it's just so vast. There's just so many different areas that we could focus on to try and protect these kids. And uh, it's, like, I, me personally, for my job right now, is the sextortion, and then it's just being aware because this happens in people's homes so much more than people realize, and with people that you would never suspect in a million years. So, um, just talk, be open, and communicate with the kids all the time. <laughs> Violet Mi'kmaq is my name, and I want to thank you very much for coming today. Um, I really admire you for the work you do, and um, I know it's not, e not always easy. Um, I think I read in your biography that you had some training in cohort operations, and I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more about that and how you've utilized it in Alberta. I know that sometimes you catch the offenders by being undercover and officers are pretending to be victims. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear about that a little bit. Sure. 
Uh, yeah, I have taken some training. Um, part of the training, especially on the RCMP side, we have to do some training before we go online. And then uh, at the Canadian Police College, our, whenever we get a new investigator, you start out taking DTEC, which is like the digital technology, and then the CAMAs, which is ICE investigations, and then there's advanced ICE, and that's where they focus more on the UC side of things. Um, I did take it, I have been trained in it. I have used that training for different investigations when it is required, but I've actually never been, a, pardon me, a designated UC operator or, or covert investigator. Um, but that's one of the things we're focusing on right now, actually, is uh, building up that part. Because we've always, we've just been, with so few people and just, you saw the stats going up, it's, it's hard to, you know, move from being proactive to, or sorry, reactive to proactive. And so that's something we're trying to focus on more. But uh, the offenders that our UC people have been able to identify and investigate have been uh, very successful, very successful cases. Um, it involves people who have never been on our radar, but it also involves people who have been on our radar more than once. Uh, I've been in the unit long enough that I'm starting to, I've arrested the same guy three or four times. Like, it's, they go to jail, they get out, they offend, they go to jail, they get out. Um, but <clears throat> the, uh, myself, I haven't done a full, full on, but it's interesting. It's a lot of work though, it's a lot of work, because we are held to such a high standard, which, so we should. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. Related to either prevention or to your job, if you could give advice or recommendation to the orders of government, what is the one thing you would most like to see them do? Oh, sorry, Belinda Croson. I went backwards on that. Okay, <clears throat> so let me understand the question clearly. Is Basically, what would I ask the government to do for prevention? Yeah, if they listen to anybody, what would you want them to do? Oh. So much. Uh, uh, honestly, I tell people, like, I would be very happy if we killed the internet. I would. <laughs> I would be more than willing to go to the bank to pay my bills, or write a letter to a friend, or pick up the phone and make a phone call. Uh, but that's um, not the way it's going to go. Um, we are living in a much different world. Our generation right now. I always say, like, I'm, I'm a parent right now, and I say that we are the first gen of parents who are raising kids in this world, and it is challenging. Even doing what I'm doing, I have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old, and it is exhausting trying to stay on top of this. So, um, I'm very, very passionate about what we do, and I guess if I was to ask for anything, it's, I don't even know how to, to, to phrase this professionally. <laughs> it, uh, just to make our job easier. I, I can think of nothing more important than protecting these kids. And when it comes to child exploitation, you know, just all the case law coming out, I could go on about a few different case laws that have come out and it just it creates that extra step, that extra layer that we have to do, that extra layer of protection for the offenders. Um, I would say, if I had to ask for one specific thing, it's uh, actually there's a bill that just received its first reading. I can't remember which one, bill 70, something or 63. Anyways, it involves passwords. And I don't have a problem writing a production order for subscriber information. I get it, I get the privacy thing. But uh, right now, if we arrest a guy, and with technology nowadays, Encryption is getting harder and harder for our techs, who are the smartest people I know, to to crack and get into. And every time there's a change or an update, they have to, you know, find another way. Is something to compel people that we are investigating when they're under arrest to compel them to provide their password to access their device. It. I'm not interested in the banking. I understand there's a lot of private information. I'm just trying to save kids, and. Um, I kind of, and I'm sure a lawyer will tell me there's a lot more to it, Heather, but I kind of like look at it like impaired driving. 
If you get pulled over for impaired driving and you are read the breath demand and you have to blow into an instrument to prove, to show that you're not intoxicated um, and you refuse, you're charged with refusal. You get charged with refusal and you get the same kind of punishment or you know, like sentence, I guess would be a more appropriate term, than it had you actually blown over points early. And I kind of, and there is a lot, it's my understanding that's the way it is over in the UK, and I believe in New Zealand or Australia, where you have to provide your password. And if you don't, you will get charged with that. Because if you, <laughs> all I'm interested in is, is, are you abusing children? Do you have child pornography? If you don't, if you don't have anything bad on your phone, you shouldn't be able to give up the password. But that's, that would be my one request, if we don't kill the internet. So support that bill. Write your MP. It's an ah, uh, it's a one of those bills that uh, you know, a member's bill. So support. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Patricia Baswa. I'm listening <clears throat> to what you were saying and what you were showing us. I think most of us have gone through some emotions between disgust and anger to, to see this. But I'm wondering about the people who do this every morning when they get up, they've got families at home and they know they're going to work and they're going to be dealing with this kind of filth. Uh, I don't quite know, uh, I, I didn't get what position this gentleman was here. Is he, are you an example of somebody who does to do yeah. that? So, yeah, Heather and I are partners. I'm in Lethbridge, she's in Calgary, we're on the same team and do the same job. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll explain it. Uh, I, I just, what, what, what happens to your own mental health? What kind of care is taken to protect the people who have to deal with this full time? I think that is a, a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, just to, for everyone that didn't quite hear Tupper up here, uh, Constable Anthony Tupper is with the Lethbridge Police Service, and he is part of our ICE unit. Uh, I do feel bad for Tupper and our guy Tyler and Medicine Hat, because they are here by themselves, but they uh, work hard um, and do the same thing as, as us as investigators. But my unit, we cover all of Southern Alberta. I don't think I actually said that. So like from Red Deer South, so um, even though he's in an office by himself, when it comes to investigate or interviews or search warrants, we, we up and we come and we all move together to execute these warrants throughout the province. And that kind of segues into about mental health. Uh, specifically for the Southern Alberta ICE unit, I can say I've been in this unit for as long as I have because I've had amazing teammates. Uh, I work with great people. I've had great bosses. Um, they're always very supportive. And uh, over the years, I have seen each year they're trying harder for mental health wellness. And uh, we have bring your dog to work Wednesdays. So we get to sign up and bring our dog. We had a little puppy there yesterday. We got puzzles out, we got a little corner. Um, and we all know that we can talk to each other. Um, I, I don't know, I just, uh, I did, detachment policing. I loved it. I was out in the community lots. I did my first six and a half over in Pincher Creek. And uh, and then I was in organized crime. Eh, it's not my jam. <laughs> uh, but uh, when I got into the ICE unit, I really felt like I was making a difference. So I think that's what keeps me going. Um, but we are doing more and more each year to try and uh, help members across all ICE investigators with uh, mental health and a lot of our alert members just went down to Kentucky for a mental health wellness uh, conference and they're just learning lots of different things that we can do. So they are trying. Uh, so some people they know they can't handle it and some people come in and they are affected by it, but uh, um, it's 100% one of the most re rewarding jobs I've ever had. Carter, and I really appreciated your presentation today, um, especially when you were saying that it's so important to talk to your kids, talk to your grandkids, but we know that doesn't always happen. And 
And we know that doesn't always happen. Um, and then in light of the material that you're presenting, I would think that in the school they would think of this as part of sex education. And our recent government that has said that people need to opt in as opposed to opting out of these kind of things. Just your comment on that as to whether this is one more way that we're kind of uh, pushing these issues out of sight, out of mind, um, and if there's things we can be doing as members of the community to say, no, we have to be talking about these things in our schools. Uh, I, to go back a couple of questions and to, to, along the theme of this where she thanked me for going out into the schools, I am so excited to go out into the schools. I am like, I, I've got so many ideas. Um, I don't know, like it's a, that's a very good point. I never really thought about it that way, being part of the sex ed curriculum and, and all the stuff going on right now. I know that we're invited, like even like members from the Luna Center, who um, you know they go and do talks about consent and um, boundaries. Um, I've gone and done some talks, but I've never been, never really thought about it as a sex ed point of view. So I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question to ask educators, because uh, I plan on going out to school divisions. There's there's programs I want to get into the schools. Um, like Kids in the Know, the Canadian Center for Child Protection has this program, it's, it's developed from K right up to 12 and to high school and it, you know, each year is a different um, level of introduction. Like some of the materials you'll see back there that are on the table, so that's all from the Canadian Center. And they've developed a program that is specific to each province's own curriculum and so uh, I want to try and get those out there as well. Um, that's, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that exactly because I never really thought about it as that, like having to get parents to opt in to listen to us talk. So um, that's that's something I'm definitely gonna be mindful of and have a discussion with. But I hope they let us come in and talk because uh, there's just no way out of this other than education and we already know what it's like to raise kids and you know like we've raised them with stranger stranger danger and we've raised them about drugs and you know don't do drugs and uh, alcohol and don't drink and drive and you know but some still do it and people still do it so um, I'm hoping to get out there and even if I can just help you know a handful out of the many that will be a win for me, but uh, hopefully they'll let me do that. It's time for one more question. Lucky me, I screwed up here in time. Um, Noella Piquette, um, recently retired education professor, and I think I can answer. <laughs> I'm so used to my voice projecting everywhere, I forget about mics. Um, I think I can probably answer that question. Um, in my former life, before becoming a professor, I was a junior high counselor, and in health, we taught the sex ed courses. This definitely could be in sex ed, but I would so recommend that it not be because that opting in, opting out thing, as well as many school districts, uh, if there's a religious orientation, do not teach the sex ed. It should be nested in the health education curriculum, though, because it is a part of wellness. It's a part of taking care of themselves. As family members, they can be convinced that this is an important topic by talking about protecting their children and all of you know, their friends and, and whatnot. So um, if there's ever a bill to put it in there, sign me up, I will back you up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I, I actually really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I, we can also spin it too, like, I mean, I'm just passionate about this part, right? But there's so much more when it comes to technology and what our kids are going through right now with the addiction to social media and games and communication. It's changing. It's, it's, it's just a, it's a whole different world. And so ours is just a small part, but unfortunately that part, I think, causes the most damage. But 
So just even healthy boundaries on internet safety is important. Thank you, Heather.